today's discussion, we are going to look at a very dramatic moment in the history of the Indian nation, the early days of independence, when the map of India actually emerged out of a very significant effort by the Congress leadership to integrate the princely states within the Indian Union. Actually, the map you look at today as the boundary of the Indian nation state, including the internal boundaries, the provincial boundaries, had begun to be formed around that time. If you compare this with the map of the British India, you see territories demarcated as outside of British India. And you are all aware that nearly one third of the territory of the Indian subcontinent actually belonged to the princely states. Some of these states were large states, like Hyderabad, others were very small states. Small states of the sort that you see in Talcher or uh, Dhan Canal in Odisha or the Kathiawar states in Gujarat. So to bring all of these political entities, princely states of varying sizes within the Indian Union was certainly a very difficult task. Partly because of the reason that the princes were, had by then become extremely conscious about their rights as allies of the paramount power. We are all familiar with the history of paramountcy, which goes back to the late 18th century, or the treaty uh, relationships that had evolved in the course of the early 19th century. Uh, precisely for this reason, as you know, the nationalist leadership looked upon this princely order as retrograde and as a major obstacle to the kind of vision of national unity that the Congress projected. And so there were occasions when the Congress leadership would put pressure on the princes by sending warnings or by encouraging movements in these princely states to bring them to reason. Sir, how did the Congress and the British political system evaluate the position of the princely states on the eve of the independence? The Congress position was, has always been clear. The Congress vision about the creation of a democratic, secular, progressive, modernizing India looked upon the princely states as not merely as an obstacle to India's unity, but also as the legacy of the feudal past, which needed to be removed. We all know that till the 1930s, congressmen were hesitant to participate in the movements in the princely states, but gradually these such hesitations were resolved and the Congress very directly tried to prop up state people's movements in many of these states. The British position was increasingly becoming ambiguous. You are all familiar with the story of how the British tried to draw them out of their exclusive, closely guarded territories, draw them out from their exclusive preserve to become partners in constitutional developments. So we can take up the story later. But if you look at 1946-47, the time when all this drama was taking place, because the integration of the princely states, as you know, had a dramatic content as well. It had happened dif through different stages. And the whole notion of integration did not simply involve the integration of the states alone, because you have French settlements, French colonies, the Portuguese colonies, all these were also subsequently brought within the territory of the Indian Union, which is, of course, a different story, but it has a certain connection with the main theme of today's discussion, which is about the integration of the states and the creation of the territorial boundary of the Indian Union. You are all familiar with the story of how Goa was brought within the Indian Union through police action in 1961. And some of the French settlements also had the same fate in the course of the 1950s. 
But the princely states were somewhat different because these were Indian territories ruled by Indians and they were bound by certain kinds of treaty obligations with the British and the British during those moments of uh, difficulties or during those years when they were slowly winding up their business in India, they started maintaining a very ambiguous attitude towards the princess. At one level, by following the older strategy, they were trying to draw them out and turn them into partners in the new union by asking them to become associated with the constituent assembly. But at the same time, there were statements made by the British officials, including the Prime Minister, Clement Attlee. In fact, Attlee made a statement in February 1947 that with the transfer of power, the terms of agreement between the paramount power and the states would cease to function. So the princes apparently were actually asked to carve out their own niches within the subcontinent by claiming autonomy, by claiming independence in the same way they had enjoyed certain degree of autonomy, of course, under treaty obligations with the British. And in this kind of a position that the Ratley too can encourage the princes to claim autonomy or they encourage the princes to resist the idea of becoming involved in the Indian Union. Jinnah also made similar such statements on the eve of the transfer of power. This was encouraging the princely states to consider the possibility of existing as independent units within the subcontinent but outside the territorial boundary of the newly emerging Indian Union. Attlee, of course, qualified this position later by suggesting that in the altered context, it would be wiser for the princes to join either of the two dominions, to participate in the constituent assembly deliberations, and ultimately to march into the larger political entities which were emerging at that time. But the ambiguity that the British position was actually suggesting, the ambiguity arising from their anxiety to maintain the treaty obligations on the one hand, to maintain their protection of the princely states on the one hand, and their failure to uphold the autonomy of the princely order in the very changing circumstances. This certainly posed a problem for the British, especially when the nationalist leadership was emphatic about the need for the princely states to choose either of the two unions by joining the constituent assembly. Nehru had already criticized the cabinet mission when the cabinet mission actually tried to create a separate relationship or tried to allow the princes a separate kind of identity within the union. And when the political office was about to be wound up, in view of the termination of the paramountcy in India, Nehru was also critical of the manner in which this was encouraging the princes to remain outside of the Union. So a state department, a department of states was created by the interim government with Ballabhai Patel as the minister in charge, VP Menon as his official, and they were the architects of the integration. Yes? Sir, how did this princely states feature in the constitutional discussion of 1930. Yeah, not just 1930, but no, throughout the 1930s. Yeah, throughout the 1930s. This is the point that I was actually making, and it's a very important question, because the discussions and the deliberations on the merger and the integration of the princely states during the 1940s, around 1945-46, when the cabinet mission came to India, when the plan for integration of the states was worked out, executed by men like Patel or Nehru, the British had already tried to draw them out, as I was saying, from their shells. You may recall the Act of 1935, where the federation idea was sought to be implemented. Uh, there was a proposal for a federal legislature, of which the princes were also expected to be very important parts. Ultimately, that federal legislature didn't come off, that federation idea didn't come off due to the rejection of this proposal by the princes, and uh, the government of India didn't find enough time to 
uh, persuade the princes ultimately to accept the federation because in the meanwhile the war intervened. But if you go even backwards in time to 1930, think of the round table conferences and in those conferences the princes were present. I mean it was in the round table conferences this idea of federation was first mooted. It was not as if that the princes readily accepted this. There were dissenting opinions. Some people were willing to uh, join the federation. Others were somewhat hesitant. Others were suspicious. So you see the, the attempt by the British to draw them out and turn them into partners in the constitutional schemes that they were enunciating from the 1930s onwards during the roundtable conferences and later in the 1935 Act. So if, if you look at the period between, say, 1927 and 1937, when the elections were held under the new Act, you see these attempts, but this didn't succeed. The princes were somewhat resistant to the schemes. They wished to retain their autonomy. They wished to retain the kind of relationship that the whole idea of paramountcy implied. They emphasized on the sacrosanctity of the treaties that they had signed with the British. But times were changing because once the Congress realized that the princes were going to be a very serious obstacle to their vision of unity, which became quite evident in the way the princes were refusing to be a part of a political order for the Indian Union, the Congress started linking up with the popular movements in the princely states. And you are all familiar with the history of these popular movements, how the state people's movements began to develop in many of these states and providing in the process a different kind of impetus for integration. The implication would become clear later, but already from 1938 onward, there were attempts by the Congress to encourage these movements, inspired by nationalism, and uh, this nationalist inspiration was making its impact on the inhabitants of the princely states, uh, regardless of whether the rulers were willing to sail with the nationalist tide or not. Now this problem, this question of whether the princess should be treated as a part of a larger political order along with the British Indian provinces, whether the princely states and the British Indian provinces would come together to create the territorial boundary of the future Indian state, all these questions which existed somewhat as, as academic questions earlier, became far more important during the 1940s, especially after the war, when the British certainly had decided to wind up their empire. So if you look at the Cripps mission of 1942, Stafford Cripps, while cajoling the princes to become associated with the Federation scheme, also was considering their protection in accordance with the treaty obligations. All this is indicative of the kind of uncertainty that was affecting the British official policy at that time. They are bound by the treaty to give them protection. They knew that during the war when the Congress was actually organizing a movement against the empire, the princes stood with them as steadfast loyal allies. They allowed the British to recruit soldiers, they mobilized resources for them, so there was a certain kind of feeling that the British had for this princely order. But at the same time, the situation was such that they found it impossible to accord the same kind of protection that they had been able to do earlier. So Stafford Cripps's uncertainties, the Stafford Cripps's ambiguous statements during his visit in 1942 is just one illustration of such ambiguities. You will see the same thing in the statements made by the cabinet mission during their visit in 1946. While they were actually asking the princes to join the constituent assembly, 
at the same time they were actually thinking of how the princes possibly could create their own niches within the subcontinent. Sir, wouldn't you say that before the cabinet mission came to India, the fate of the princely rulers were already sealed? Yes, to a large extent what you are saying is correct. Because by the time the cabinet mission came to India, the popular opinion in most of the princely states was decidedly in favor of integration with the states. If you look at the cab statement by the cabinet mission, you can see this problem. The cabinet mission was willing to give them the choice, but at the same time asking them to consider the existing situation where the choice was a matter of compulsion. I mean, they were asking them to participate in the constituent assembly and uh, was not actually providing or projecting before them any alternative. By the time the cabinet mission came, to a large extent the fate of the princes were sealed because the political equations by then had changed so remarkably that princes were not likely to survive anymore as British allies in the subcontinent enjoying British protection. So some of these states therefore decided to join the constituent assembly, but others hesitated. A few others were in fact resistant to the idea of joining the constituent assembly. Even if many of these states were trying constantly to negotiate with Indian political groups, the Nawaba Bhupal, who was playing a very important role in the Chamber of Princes, was cultivating a close relationship with the Muslim League. Some of the Rajput states were um, closely tied with Hindu Mahasava activists. Nizam of Hyderabad was using communal elements in his own state to use them as a kind of an antidote to Congress mobilization. So it was not as if that the princes were simply relying on British protection and staying away from the kind of politics that was actually going on at that time. They were becoming linked with various kinds of political groups. But at the same time, in order not to be swayed entirely by this tide, they came up with the suggestion of a union of princely states existing side by side with the Union of India. Some of the states were considering the possibility of creating regional combination. The Orissa states, for example, in December 1947, after independence, after much success had been achieved in integrating the states, also continued to fondle with this idea of a regional integration, regional union of Orissa states. So the resistance to the idea of being completely swallowed up by the emerging Indian nation state was endemic. And they were actually banking upon those statements by the officials that with the termination of fair paramountcy, the kind of obligation or the kind of relationship that the states had with the government of India ceases. So that was an advantage for the princes. They could say that the legal obligation doesn't exist anymore. Therefore, we have the right to be completely independent. So Nehru sensed the danger in this kind of a position taken by the princes, secretly encouraged by the British. So he insisted on the creation of the State Department with Patel in its command. And the strategy that, the, that Patel and VP Menon adopted during 1946-47, till independence and after independence as well, uh, is known as the standstill agreement. The strategy of signing standstill agreement with the princes. The independent states would um, continue to be bound by these agreements. But these states were expected to sign instruments of accession. Sir, what role did the popular movements play in the integration of the princely states? Yes. In the historiography, usually the role of Patel and V.P. Menon has often been given uh, quite legitimately a good deal of attention. 
Patel was successful in making them sign the instruments of accession. They were ultimately compelled. Most of them joined the Indian Union. In return for that, Patel promised them their privileges and privy purses. So we see that between the 2nd and 14th August, during those very crucial data, uh, weeks, a large number of states decided to join Indian Union, with the exception of Hyderabad, Mysore, and uh, Junagar or Kashmir, where the integration took place through a certain kind of dramatic intervention by the Indian Army and the Indian police. While we acknowledge that, we have to consider also the important contribution that popular movements actually made to the creation of a political environment in which accession to the Indian Union became almost inevitable. Because there was no alternative, there was no escape for these princely states from this eventuality. Think of those dramatic incidents during 1947-48, through which interventions took place in Junagar, in Kashmir, in Hyderabad, or also in Mysore to some extent, because there was a major movement in Mysore which compelled the ruler of Mysore ultimately to accept the idea of joining the Indian Union. And Mysore eventually became the basis of one of the major states in independent India. We have already indicated that the boundaries of the present provinces, that the present uh, constituent states of India were actually demarcated at that time. Certainly, linguistic reorganization of the states also was an important factor. The Congress had accepted the reorganization of the provinces on a linguistic basis, and together with this integration process that was happening around this time, they demarcated the boundaries. Because once the states actually signed those instruments of accession, Patel and others compelled these states to come to an agreement regarding the merger of their territories within the constituent states. But all this was successful largely because of the kind of impetus that had already been given by popular movements in many of these states, and which goes back to the 1930s, which about which you are all familiar. You think of Junagar, for example. The Nawab of Junagar decided to join Pakistan. There was a huge uproar against it in Junagar. The predominantly Hindu uh, subjects of Junagar decided against this. And ultimately, since troubles began to break out, the Prime Minister of Junagar, Shah Nawaz Bhutto, father of the later Prime Minister of Pakistan, Zulfikar Ali, asked for government of India's intervention, and there was a plebiscite held, and Junagar became a part of Indian Union after the plebiscite decided in favor of accession to India in early 1948. Kashmir is a well-known story. There was an ongoing movement against the autocracy of Hari Singh, a Hindu ruler, by the National Conference. The National Conference was inspired by nationalist ideas, had links with people like Nehru, Nehru once went to Kashmir and had to court arrest as a supporter of the National Conference. But Hari Singh resisted the idea of joining the Indian Union till there was a military intervention from Pakistan, forcing Hari Singh to sign the instrument of accession and deciding to merge into India. But Kashmir Gisu remained a thorny problem and it has not yet been resolved because the plebiscite was never held. But that is a different story. Hyderabad, there was an ongoing movement against Nizam, uh, organized by the congressmen from Andhra region. By the time all these decisions had to be taken, there was a communist late peasant movement in Telangana, and the Telangana movement to a large extent had been able to impart an element of radicalism in the region. So the Nizam, when he was deciding against marching into the Indian Union, tried to organize his own paramilitary units called Razakars, who began to tyrannize the local population in an attempt to thwart the advance of the Congress in the region. So the, the resultant trouble actually called for intervention by the Indian police. The, there was a police action, and ultimately that decided the fate of Hyderabad. You have these dramatic instances, dramatic instances of how the integration was a very heroic story of national integration.
executed by Patel and VP Menon. But as I said, the popular dimension of this requires recognition. Sumit Sarkar has gone to the extent of suggesting that with Nizam Patel could sort out the problems. But because there was a major popular communist upsurge in the region, the police action had to take place. Patel and others couldn't wait anymore for the communists to consolidate their hold in that region. This is one line of reasoning about the reason why this police interven intervention took place in the way it did around that time. So there can be different ways of looking at the history of integration. One might see is, as the successful pursuit of the strategy of integration by men like Patel, assisted by V.P. Menon, V.P. Menon's autobiography would tell you this story. But at the same time, you have this other dimension of people in these states deciding in favor of integration, agitating in favor of integration, and giving the Congress the necessary foothold in the regions, the necessary support in the regions to pursue the strategy of integration. In any case, the story of integration is important because at the time when the country was partitioned, at the time when the government of the union had not yet been to consolidate its hold over the country, the integration of the state gave a certain kind of moral strength to the makers of independent India.